Good afternoon. This is William Lee, a Structured Finance Associate at Alston & Bird, and a pro bono volunteer with the Asian American Bar Association of New York. First and foremost, we hope you are well and remain safe during these unprecedented times. Thank you for joining our small business presentation series, generously co-sponsored by the Asian American Bar Association of New York, Littler, and Alston and & Bird in honor of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Today's presentation will focus on labor and employment law issues, and tomorrow's presentation will focus on restructuring and bankruptcy options. If you would like to access Abney's other COVID materials, including its resource pages on anti-Asian American violence and small business financial assistance, please copy and paste the first link. If you are a New York State small business owner and need direct assistance, please copy and paste the second link to fill out a clinic application with the Small Business Legal Relief Alliance. Throughout today's presentation, you may submit a question by using the Ask a Question box located on the left side of your screen. We will try to answer your questions during the program or follow up with you afterwards. This program is being recorded and will be available for playback immediately after it ends by using the same link you used to log in. All other questions can be directed to pro bono at abony.org. And on the left-hand side of your screen, you will also find event references that are available for you to download. Today's COVID relief topics will involve returning to work, opening guidelines, safety, and managing exposure issues. Our panelists today are Eugen Venero, Labor and Employment Counsel at Advanced Publications and co-chair of Abney's Labor and Employment Law Committee, and William Eng, shareholder at Littler specializing in labor and employment law. Without further ado, I introduce you to Eugen and William Ling. Thanks, William. Hi, this is Eugen, and I'd like to kick off our presentation by discussing New York's reopening guidelines. Um, our agenda would be to first discuss reopening guidelines and issues. Then Will Ng will talk about financial concerns and PPP loans. We'll also discuss employee safety issues as well as OSHA report reporting requirements. And then we'll summarize for you relevant paid sick leave laws as well as wage and hour compliance. So as you know, COVID-19 is like no challenge we've ever dealt with before. It has turned our lives upside down to say the least. After more than two months of being on pause, New York has now issued a plan to reopen. The plan is based on regions, and unfortunately, New York City is not open yet. Uh, but so far, the, open, the regions that have reopened are cap the Capital Region, Central New York, Finger Lakes, Mid-Hudson, Mohawk Valley, North Country, Southern Tier, and Western New York. So the New York's reopening guidelines discuss not only a plan to open region by region, but also reopening in phases one through four. And here's the breakdown of those industries in each phase. If you want to know if you are in an industry that's permitted to reopen, you would find this slide helpful. So phase one, which would be the first ones to reopen, would be construction, manufacturing, retail, which is limited to curbside or in-store pickup or drop-off only. Phase two includes professional services, retail, real estate, and rental and leasing. Phase three is restaurants and food services. Phase four is arts, entertainment, recreation, and education. So in order for businesses to reopen, there are certain requirements that you must meet. And I want to go through some of these requirements with you. Uh, the first would be for you to develop and post a business safety plan. And this is a plan that 
describes how you will prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. On the right side of the slide, you'll see a template. Um, it's offered by the New York State. You can fill this out if you want, but you can also develop your own plan. And so you don't necessarily have to use this template. Keep in mind that this template, once you fill it out, you're not required to submit it to any state agency. Um, what you need to do with it is to make sure that you post it in somewhere conspicuous in the workplace and make sure that you have it available when, um, when there is an inspection by the New York State Department of Health in the event of an inspection. Um, the next thing that you need to do is to submit a business affirmation. And this is a form that you need to submit. Um, you, what you do is um, you would rev you review a state-issued industry guideline and you affirm that you reviewed it, you understand it, and you will implement it using an online form. And that you'll be able to find in the New York State website. Um, so phase one included various industries and based on the industry, there are different guidelines that you need to follow. Um, instead of going through all of them by one, I thought it would be helpful to summarize the common mandatory elements for all industries to follow if you're in phase one. The first requirement is that you keep physical distancing and what this means is that you as a business owner must make sure that workers are working within a six feet distance unless that's not feasible. And if it is not feasible, you have to make sure that everyone is wearing acceptable face coverings. Um, in addition to that, make sure that uh, the workforce is no more than 50% of maximum capacity Second would be protective measures, and this includes face coverings. So all current phase one industries that are allowed to reopen must provide face coverings like masks, gloves to employees at no cost. And you also should make sure that people uh, don't share objects and you should discourage your employees from touching shared surfaces. Next would be hygiene and cleaning, and this is where you're required to make sure you have a hand hygiene station where people can wash their hands and also provide alcohol-based sanitizers. The next element is communication. Um, as I've mentioned previously, you are required to affirm that you reviewed and understand the guidelines and you will implement it. In addition to that, um, you, what you should do is remind people working to uh, keep social distancing, post sign signage, reminding people of doing that, and reminding people of proper hygiene. Uh, last would be screening, and basically um, what your obligations are uh, is that you need to make sure that if employees come to work sick, you, you make sure that they go back home um, and also implement a health screening assessment, which is something I'll discuss in more detail later. Uh, next is an example of industry best practices. So, so far, New York has issued guidelines for phase one industries, but for other industries that are not in phase one, there isn't a set guideline yet. So there have been movements by trade associations who issue their own guidelines and best practices in order to help businesses reopen amid the COVID-19 pandemic. So an example would be the National Restaurant Association's guidance. And here, um, for restaurants, what this association suggests is that first, um, in, uh, refreshing safe food handling and preparation training for employees. 
Second, increased cleaning and sanitizing, and this would include um, frequently disinfecting seats, avoiding table presets. Third is reinforcing employee health and personal hygiene measures like uh, providing face covering and implementing strict hand washing policies and also social distancing, uh, which would include having mobile ordering apps, having disposable or digital menus if it's not possible to disinfect. Um, and now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Will Ng. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So now I'm going to be talking about uh, the PPP loans that many of you have heard about in the news. Um, some companies have applied for them. Uh, Congress created the PPP as part of the $2 trillion coronavirus aid, relief, and economic act. Um, as many of you may know, it's sort of known as the CARES Act. This legislation was authorized by the Treasury to use the SBA's uh, 7A Small Business Lending Program to fund loans of up to $10 million per borrower that qualifying businesses could use to spend to cover payroll, mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. Now, we'll be discussing sort of some of the uh, finer details of it and uh, some of the, the program details with regards to loan forgiveness, which has been uh, in the news recently. Now, as you may know, PPP borrowers can qualify to have the loans forgiven if the proceeds are used to pay certain eligible costs. However, the amount of loan forgiveness will be reduced if less than 75% of the funds are spent on payroll over an eight-week loan forgiveness period. Now, just to put it in context of which businesses are eligible for this program, uh, for givable loans to businesses with 500 or fewer employees. Um, and in terms of some statistics that might be helpful for you to understand uh, the, the, the breadth of this program, through May 23rd, the SBA approved more than 4.4 million PPP loans, totaling more than $511 billion. Currently, we are in the second round of funding and about $138 billion in loans remain available for additional lending. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, this program right now and sort of controversial is sort of must be used during this eight week covered period, starting with the first loan dis disbursement. There's currently uh, uh, discussion within uh, Congress about extending this period of time. And those are the two main issues right now. Um, the SBA loan doesn't um, make enough changes uh, to the eight-week period um, in order for the PPP funds to be spent on uh, a qualified payroll cost. Recently, on May 15th, the, pay the loan forgiveness application came out. And in this in this program, in this application, they provided some instructions, but there's some concern about a little uh, practical guidance. Now, what we would always tell you is that whenever you work with um, uh, the PPP loan, that you must work with a qualified CPA and your lender who you obtained the loan from. The original lender will be approving the application and not a government agency. William Ang, this is William Lee. Sure. We have a question for you from the audience. Sure. So the question is, do you know if the PPP Flexibility Act will be passed? That will affect the coverage period and the payroll percentage. So is this act a, yep. So right now, currently, what's uh, before the Senate and before the House are competing um, amendments to this law. Um, right now, there's discussions about whether it would be extended to 16 weeks or potentially up to 24 weeks. And the main problem that businesses have are that if they were to receive the loan in the first or second round of the funding, um, they would have to use it before they're even able to be open. So for example, if you're a restaurant in New York and you're part of the round of the phase three of reopening, 
And if you received a loan uh, within the last month, you would only have essentially four weeks to be able to use the rest of the loans, but you're not allowed to even be open. So, you know, while there's dispute as to how long it may, the extension may be for, there is, there seems to be bipartisan agreement that there should be an extension. The other controversial issue is whether or not 75% of uh, the funds that you receive from the loan, whether how much of that can be used on payroll costs and how much of that can be used for non-qualified payroll costs. And this current slide that's in front of you right now, we talk about forgivable payroll costs, and that would be uh, sort of payroll costs uh, paid and incurred during the covered period. And that was a change recently uh, through the uh, loan forgiveness application. Before it was only paid and not incurred. Um, and the difference is if you were to actually uh, have a payment but actually pay it after the eight-week period of time. The SBA said that now in situations like that, that would still be a, for, a forgivable payroll cost. The other payroll qualified payroll cost would be employer health insurance premiums, employer 401k contributions, state and local taxes on employee compensation. Up to 25% of non-payroll costs are forgivable, and that would include mortgage and rent obligations, utility payments for services beginning uh, before February 15, 2020. In terms of uh, loan documentation that you need in order to have your loan forgiven, you need to sort of keep the, app, the, the documents that you submitted in, in order to get the application. So what we've been advising clients would be your payroll cost, uh, your uh, second quarter Form 941, or the equivalent New York State 45s, and documents establishing the employment of each individual on the Schedule A worksheet. You would also want to keep job offers, um, any refusals, and make sure and ensure that you document uh, any individuals who are returning from furlough. So the Paycheck Protection uh, Flexibility Act, this is sort of what we've been talking about, about some of the uh, topics that are on the table as to whether or not uh, there can be some amendments to this program. And some of the bipartisan uh, issues right now that are they're talking about is sort of extending beyond the eight-week period, eliminating the restrictions of the payroll expenses to only 25% of the loan proceeds, eliminating the restrictions that limit loan terms to two years, and ensuring full access to the payroll tax deferment for businesses that take the PPP loans, and extending the hiring read deadline to offset the effect of an enhanced unemployment insurance. As many of you may know, um, there is an additional program that allows um, eligible folks to be able to collect unemployment insurance up through July 31st. And that's causing some issues because employees are deciding not to return to work after jobs are being offered back to them. As I mentioned, this is still pending before the Senate. I'm going to turn William, over to Angie. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, we just had one question from the audience. Sure. While on the topic of wrapping up PPP, the question is, do you know if the PPP Flexibility Act will be passed that will, uh, that will affect the coverage period and the payroll percentage? Yeah, and as I mentioned, um, uh, right now, you know, we've heard reports as, as, as early as tomorrow that, it, you know, some, some version of it will be passed. Uh, we do believe that there will be an extension. Um, with regards to the issue of the 75%, um, that is still up in the air about whether or not it would be sort of reduced from 75% to potentially 50%. Uh, but again, we should know hopefully within, within the week, um, both the House and the Senate have their own bills. Um, they sort of need to be sort of reconciled uh, in order for, you know, for the American people to have some clarity on, um, on how, to, how to sort of use their funds.
Thank you, Will. Thank you, William Eng. I'm not sure if we covered this question, but uh, I'm going to ask it. I'm going to ask it anyways before we move on. What about the mid-sized business loan program that is capped at 2% rates as part of the CARES Act? Has there been additional guidance on how to get those funds? No, um, not that I'm aware of at this moment. Great, thank you. Um, thanks, Will. So now I'm going to talk about what happens when you do reopen and what measures you can take in order to keep your workplace safe. So a, a, a hot topic in terms of reopening and inviting employees back in office would be temperature checks. Um, when you do decide to bring your employees back in the office, back in the workplace, you would want to conduct uh, temperature checks to make sure that that employee um, doesn't have the coronavirus, is not infected with COVID-19. Um, I would note that generally speaking, temperature checks is a medical examination that is unlawful in um, normal circumstances unless it's job related and consistent with business necessity. Um, but because of the ongoing pandemic, um, the EEOC has recently um, issued guidance saying that this standard is met because employees who have the coronavirus uh, pose a direct threat to the health and well-being of others. So one thing that you can do when you reopen and have employees back in is to do a temperature check. But note that this isn't a perfect solution because not everyone that has the coronavirus would necessarily show symptoms such as high fever. But this is definitely something that you can do um, and it's an option available to you. If you do decide to do temperature checks, uh, you might want to think about who would be conducting it. You could designate a person from your own business um, to conduct the test themselves, or you can have a third party trained expert conduct the temperature checks. Um, make sure that once you do it and there are symptomatic employees, make sure to send them home. And also keep in mind that um, the, the, any information that you get from the temperature checks is confidential. So not only should you document um, these records properly, but make sure that they're kept, they're kept safe and confidential. So in addition to doing temperature checks, uh, you would want to have a health screening protocol. Um, this is basically a policy that you would want to implement so that all employees are on the same page and you're able to maintain a health and safety workplace, safe workplace um, one thing you can do is have your employees check their own temperatures at home before leaving um, to go, go to work. And then once they do arrive at work, you can check their temperatures again. Um, I want to also note that the EEOC expanded the, the permissible use of medical exams to COVID-19 testing. So you can actually test employees not just for their temperatures, but also whether or not they have uh, COVID-19 or not. And that's also allowed um, per the EEOC guidance. Make sure that when you are implementing this health screening protocol, everyone is subject to it and you're not targeting one specific uh, population, one specific nationality, um, so that you don't uh, violate um, the anti-discrimination laws. Uh, in addition to these, you can also do um, ask questions to your employees, and this is allowed. Um, you can ask questions such as uh, whether or not your employees are experiencing any COVID-19 related symptoms, whether or not they've been in close contact 
with someone who's had the coronavirus and whether or not they have good reason to believe that they've been exposed to someone who's had um, the coronavirus. Next um, is personal protective equipment, PPE, and I'm sure you've heard of this a lot. PPE, PPE is basically face covering, um, masks, gloves, um, and when you do reopen, it is your responsibility to provide PPE to your employees at no cost. It should be free. You should not be charging for them. Make sure that these face coverings are not shared. Make sure that you properly store them. And when it's no longer usable, you should discard them. Um, in addition to that, there might be some accommodation issues concerned with the use of PPE. Um, make sure that you are able to accommodate when necessary. An example would be um, offering gowns for employees who use wheelchairs. Um, and then next I'll hand it over to Will. Sure. So we are now going to be talking about social distancing in the workplace. Some of these examples that are on the slide are similar to what Eugene has already discussed. Um, they should probably be part of your safety plan. And some of the trade associations, uh, such as the real estate uh, firm Cushman Wakefield, has also developed some best practices. And the trade associations are really you know, filling in the gaps where uh, some government guidelines may be insufficient or unclear. But some examples of um, uh, things of to, to, sure, to ensure social distancing really sort of as the picture dictates, um, depicts, having um, you know, separate areas, uh, limitations as to who can uh, get on an elevator. Um, as you'll see in the photo, it's only four people. Normal capacity could be much more. Having traffic flow for arrows for customers. Um, and many restaurants now you'll see um, marks of where people can stand and where people can move. Um, uh, the other uh, options that you can also sort of implement are really having uh, staggered start and, start and stop times to ease congestion. Um, so a lot of companies are now having overlapped schedules, um, you know, three or four shifts um, as opposed to a typical two-shift schedule. Um, in addition, the, the whole point is really to sort of um, reduce density, reduce capacity, and just making sure that there's uh, sufficient space and, and time between folks. Um, we also would encourage additional hand washing and sanitizing stations, um, and, and that's really the employer's obligation to make sure that all of these stations are all set up. In addition, uh, com consider impact if, on ease of access by visitors and vendors, um, such as keeping doors open, keeping um, uh, sanitation stations uh, right by the access points. Now we're going to be talking about uh, developing an exposure plan. You know, before returning employees to work, um, it's very crucial that uh, employers develop a, a control plan, uh, which will include protocols for sending employees home, uh, instituting contact tracing to identify other employees, uh, cleaning the workplace, and keeping a record keeping of sort of issues that are coming up. Um, as part of the exposure uh, and action plan, you'd let, you really need to sort of lay out how to protect yourself and the employees. You should cite the latest CDC and OSHA guidance. Uh, you should outline some pr precautions to take at work. Um, you should also outline sort of what the company will provide, such as um, PPE equipment, um, uh, mask. Um, you should also reference if the company is taking steps to sort of hire outside cleaners. Um, in this exposure plan, you should also be thinking about um, having sort of set protocols for each situation. For example, uh, what to do if an employee has COVID-19 symptoms, what happens if a person has tested positive but is no longer um, show, showing any symptoms, if that person is recovering at home, 
uh, when that person is allowed to return uh, to the workplace. And these are all part of the considerations that you need to sort of identify in your exposure control plan. The other thing that we would recommend in terms of developing a plan is really to actively check the CDC um, for the most recent updates. Um, there have been changes as recently as May 6th. Now we're going to be talking a little about OSHA recording and reporting um, so that you know, um, as you'll see on the slide, Congress uh, created the Occupation Safety and Health Administration back in 1970 to ensure safe and healthy working conditions for all employees. The OSHA Act uh, covers private sector employees as well as some public sector employers. Uh, many employers of more than 10 employees are required to keep a record of serious work-related injuries. The record-keeping rules apply to injuries or illnesses, which is defined as an abnormal condition or disorder. We, we provide you a link for the record-keeping forms and additional information. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it's been found to, from OSHA uh, to be a recordable illness and employers must record cases if the case is a tested positive confirmed case of COVID-19. The, the case is a work-related defined as an event or exposure that either caused or contributed to the resulting condition or significantly aggravated a pre-existing injury or illness. Um, in addition, the records must be, be maintained at the workplace for at least five years and each February through April, employers must post a summary of the injuries and illnesses recorded from the previous year. In terms of the OSHA guidance that was recently updated with regards to COVID-19, we cite two links which you can sort of check out on your own free time and it will sort of provide you the most recent uh, guidance Right now, OSHA will continue to evaluate COVID-19 cases under, under one of two general frameworks. In geographic areas where the spread of COVID-19 has significantly decreased, OSHA would sort of resort back to their typical um, investigation and, and complaint procedure. However, for areas where they're experiencing a sustained uh, uh, and spike in COVID-19 exposures, they're sort of going to make this a priority to make sure that all serious uh, workplace uh, injuries and illnesses will be investigated. Thank you, Will Eng. This is William Lee again. I had we had one more question from the audience. The question is, what are the business's obligations to trace the exposure? For example, what if a hair salon finds that a worker has infected another worker or customers? Does the businesses does the business just notify the NYC DOH MH, or should they take any other uh, notice uh, procedures, or, or are there any other guidelines out there that they should follow? Sure. Um, so in situations like that, um, we sort of trace back as to who was exposed, if that person knew for a fact that that the that the the customer, if the worker, okay, if the worker has infected another worker, um, and this has come up in variations uh, with plenty of clients. Um, I ha I represent a um, a healthcare provider where that was an that was an issue, and the issue is how far back do you go? Is it every single customer or patient that that person treated? Um, and it sort of needs to be seen at sort of at a, a case by case situation. Um, if we know that person tested positive, I think the obligation to report um, and find out who every single customer or, or person that person came in contact with, outreach and sending a notice may be required. If the person was just showing symptoms, that may not be required. Um, in terms of whether or not to notify uh, a city agency, um, I'm not aware of any obligation of of reporting every single 
uh, potential contact with someone who had tested positive for COVID-19 or showing just symptoms would require a reporting of such of such um, positive sign to each agency. Great, thank you, William Eng. Um, all right, so now I'll move on and talk about uh, sick leave laws. As you know, there's been movement on the federal, state, even city level to address uh, people's need to take leave related to COVID-19. Um, there's a lot of it, but I'm going to try to summarize uh, the most relevant ones for you. The first one is the FFCRA, Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So under this act, um, there's two type of leave available. First would be the emergency paid sick leave. Second is the emergency FMLA leave benefits. Um, this would apply if you have less than 500 employees um, and you are eligible to be reimbursed for the costs of paid sick leave and expanded emergency FMLA uh, through refundable tax credits. Um, this has been in effect since April 1st, 2020, and it will sunset uh, December 31st, 2020. There is a notice requirement that you should be aware of. Um, you should post notices regarding um, the FFCRA rights in a conspicuous place that's available to employees. Uh, given that uh, most of us are now closed and working remotely, you can satisfy this posting requirement by emailing or directly mailing the notice to your employees or posting it on an employee information page on your website. So the first piece of the FFCRA is the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. Uh, basically, you can take this paid sick leave if you are unable to work or telework, um, meaning re working remotely, uh, because one, the employee is subject to a quarantine or an isolation order related to COVID-19. Two, the employee is advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine because of COVID-19. Three, the employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and is seeking a medical diagnosis. Four, the employee is caring for an individual that's subject to or advised to quarantine or isolation. Five, the employee is caring for a son or daughter whose school or place of care is closed or child care provider is unavailable due to COVID-19. Six, the employee is experiencing substantially similar conditions as specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services in consultation with the Secretaries of Labor and Treasury. So for, for the first three reasons, which was for employees' own illness, own self-care, um, you can get up to two weeks of paid sick leave. And if it were the first three reasons for self-care, um, you get it at 100% of your pay. It's capped at $511 a day, um, a total of $5,110 per person. If it's for other, if it's for caring for other people, like a minor child or a family member, you don't get 100% of your pay. It will be two thirds of um, pay that's capped at $200 a day in a total of $2,000 per person. Uh, the, the next piece of the FFCRA is the emergency family and medical leave. And under this, uh, employees are eligible to receive up to 12 weeks of FMLA leave if they are unable to work or telework, to care for a child if their child's school or place of care is closed or childcare is unavailable due to COVID-19. 
Um, whereas the emergency paid sick leave act does not require an employee to have worked for a business for a certain period of days, anyone is eligible to receive it. For emergency FMLA, the employee must have worked at least 30 calendar days. And of the 12 weeks of leave that they are entitled to, the first two weeks or first 10 days of leave would be unpaid. And then the next 10 weeks, they will be paid at two thirds of the employee's regular rate. And that is caps at $200 a day, a total of $10,000. I think it's important to note that small businesses may apply for an exemption. So if you think that you're not, if you have fewer than 50 employees and you're not able to afford this type of leave, you might, uh, you might be covered under the exemption. Um, so you might be exempt when first, the expenses and financial obligations would exceed available business revenue and cause the employer to cease operating. Um, the ab absence of employee would pose substantial risk to financial health or the operational capacity of the employer. Or if you cannot find other workers that are able, willing, qualified, and available to perform work, and such work is needed for the small employer to operate, these will be the cases where you could argue for an exemption. Moving on to the state level, I'm going to talk about um, New York state and city laws that govern um, COVID-19 related leave. So the first would be the COVID-19 sick leave law Uh, depending on the size and your income, um, you will need to provide up to 14 days of leave. Um, so if you are 10, if you have 10 or fewer employees with a net income of less than $1 million in the prior tax year, you don't have to pay for an employee to take leave and it will be unpaid until the termination of uh, the employee's quarantine. If you have 10 or fewer employees, but more than $1 million of income, you need to provide at least five days of paid leave. Um, if you have between 11 to 99 employees, you need to provide at least five days of paid leave as well. Um, so the qualifying reason for an employee to take the New York State COVID-19 sick leave law is actually very limited. It's really only when the employee has the has COVID-19. So if that employee is under a mandatory or precautionary order of quarantine or isolation that's been issued by the New York State Department of Health um, or other authorized government agency, that that would be the the time that that person is eligible to take the sick leave. And it's not, it's not, uh, it doesn't cover stay at home orders like uh, the order that we are uh, going through right now, but it, the employee has to have specifically been issued an order to stay home because that person has COVID-19. Uh, I'm going to now talk about the New York paid family leave. Um, for employees who exhaust their COVID-19 leave benefits, and given that a quarantine typically lasts 14 days, and if your business is small, um, employees would only get up to five days of paid leave, um, employees may be eligible for benefits under a New York paid family leave. It's expanded. Um, just to cover the COVID-19 situation so that people who are covered by a mandatory or precautionary order of quarantine or isolation, or if an employee has to provide care for a minor dependent child that's subject to a quarantine order, that will be covered by New York Aid Family Leave. Um, 
the process of it is that it this isn't coming from the employer directly. Uh, what the employees do instead is to submit an application to the insurance carrier. Um, this year, 2020, the pay family leave rate would be 60% of an employee's average weekly wage, and the maximum that they would get would be $840.70 per week. And for COVID-related reasons, um, this, if you're applying for COVID-related reasons, the seven-day waiting period is waived. Um, then we have the city law. And I just want to make sure that you know the New York City paid sick and safe and sick leave um, isn't a, a new law, but it does cover reasons that is applicable to the COVID-19 situation and employees could use this as a basis for seeking leave. Um, so the New York City leave law applies if you have more than five employees and eligible employees would be those who have worked more than 80 hours in a calendar year. If, the, if your business closes due to a public health emergency, which would cover what we're going through right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, or if your employee needs to take care for a child whose school or childcare provider has closed due to a public health emergency, that will be a qualifying reason for an employee to want to take the New York sick paid, New York paid sick and sick leave. So they will be eligible for up to 40 hours of paid leave and it accrues one hour for every 30 hours worked. Um, the next would be the state version. So I've just told you about the New York City uh, paid safe and sick leave law. Um, and I wanted to tell you that uh, this, uh, the, the, the state is, has passed a law that very much mirrors the city paid safe and sick leave law uh, that allows you to take leave for the same reasons um, for Employers with four or fewer employees with a net income of less than $1 million in the prior tax year, uh, you must provide employees with at least 40 hours of unpaid sick leave. If you have uh, four or fewer employees but more than $1 million of net income, then you must pay at least 40 hours of paid sick leave. Same goes for employers who have between five to 99 employees. You need to provide at least 40 hours of paid sick leave in each calendar year. And accrual begins September 30th, 2020, and employees can start using uh, paid sick leave from January 1, 2021. Okay, and then I'll just move on to the ADA. Um, I want to mention this. Um, this isn't a sick leave law, but if an employee is seeking leave, it might count or wants to work remotely uh, due to COVID-19 related reasons. Um, having them take the leave or arranging them to work remotely, it could be a reasonable accommodation that you are required to provide under the ADA. Um, and you have to provide it unless um, it's unless it would pose an undue hardship to you. Um, so in, if you do get a request to take leave or to work remotely as an accommodation, uh, make sure that you engage in an interactive process with the employee, um, document it, um, so that you don't run afoul of your obligations under the ADA. And basically what this is, is to be responsive when the employer comes to you and asks about leave. Uh, uh, make sure that you uh, document it, um, and I think you'll be fine there. Another way you can address uh, requests to take leave is through your own policy. So it can be through paid time off, PTO, having your own sick leave, 
there's nothing in the laws that would stop you from providing more benefits than required under federal or state law. So you can certainly have a more generous sick leave policy for employees to take. Um, you can have, um, uh, you can allow employees to take leave under personal or unpaid leave policies. Um, and I just wanted to share with you this scenario. So more likely you would have an employee who comes to you and tells you, hey, um, I'm not feeling well. I think I have COVID-19, like I'm showing symptoms. I haven't been tested yet, um, but I have these symptoms. Can I take, like what can you do for what options do I have? And if you look at the chart, you see the New York paid sick leave law, FMLA, emergency paid sick leave, emergency FMLA, ADA, New York paid family law and your policies. Really the only checkbox that says yes is the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, which kind of shows you that um, even with this much development in laws that were meant to address employees going through the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the requirements are quite narrow, especially if you are an employee who can work remotely. Uh, the requirements are quite narrow and harder to meet. Um, so that's something that you should keep in mind. And next I'll turn it over to my colleague, Will. Hi everyone. So we have about, uh, we wanna leave some time for question and answers. Uh, I just quickly go through some wage and hour considerations in light of the COVID-19. Um, many companies that wanna afford things in the scenario um, and with respect to their employees, they either um, unfortunately had to lay them off, that was number one. Number two, some companies also decided to furlough, which kept them um, on the payroll um, in an inactive status. Um, the third thing that a lot of companies did um, in light of COVID-19 was um, institute salary reductions. And the fourth thing that um, some companies did was reclassify salary exempt employees to hourly non-exempt employees. So this slide talks about sort of um, exempt employees and sort of what needs to be maintained in order to keep the uh, overtime exemption. Um, the three, uh, uh, three primary um, requirements to have a salary exempt employee is they need to be, uh, meets the duties test. Uh, they need to also uh, um, pass the salary basis test, which requires a pay regardless of the number of hours worked. Uh, such as in New York, it would be New York City uh, for a large employer would be at least uh, 1,125 uh, per week, which comes out annualized to 58,500. Um, in addition, uh, the salary must be bona fide; it can't be tied to the quality or quantity of work. And employees must be paid a full salary for any week in which they do any work. The next slide talks about some of the wage and hour considerations um, in light of some of the uh, return to work um, requirements that companies need to sort of implement. Um, some of the issues are sort of reporting time. What happens when an employee comes to work and you do a, a screening and the person um, is sick? Um, does that person, is that person required to be paid? Um, and these are some of the issues that uh, employers are facing right now. Um, in addition, sort of some of the off-the-clock issues that uh, employees or employers are facing are sort of temperature checks. Um, what if the temperature check is uh, done on site after work? Um, is that time compensable? What if the temperature check is um, taking place off site at another location? Um, is that time compensable in terms of your sort of your non-exempt hourly workforce? if they are sent off site to get something that's done as part of their job, um, are employers required to pay for it? And some of these issues are really what um, employers are grappling with. Um, the other common issue was really sort of uh, the, the donning and doffing and if they're wearing um, uh, the PPE equipment in manufacturing facilities, um, is that time compensable? So these are just some of the issues that we wanted to raise in terms of wage and hour considerations um, as employers start to return to work. 
Uh, we want to leave some time now um, to open it up to the floor uh, for some attendees to ask questions. Thank you very much, Willie Meng. Our first question that we want to pose to you are, how do firms, how do, how do law firms open and focus on small, and focus on uh, small firms? So this would be an em emphasis on uh, opening up some of the smaller law firms out there, given that some of our audience members are attorneys. Eugene, would, uh, um, Eugene, would you be able to answer that one, please? Sure. Um, so I think this kind of goes to one of the top considerations for when you open and when small firms open would be um, social distancing and what kind of measures that you can take to make sure that you don't spread the outbreak of COVID-19 in your workplace. Um, and there are various examples of social distancing measures that law firms can take. Um, one would be flexible work sites, so teleworking mainly. I think a lot of lawyers have been able to, to make, you know, working remotely work. So depending on, it could be a business call, but if working remotely has worked for, for lawyers, um, that might be something that you would continue to, to do until it's determined that it's safe for employees to start commuting. Um, you can also implement flexible work hours, meaning a, a doing a staggered shift so that not everyone is in the office at 100% capacity at the same time. Um, if you do have people coming to the workplace to work, you can also have uh, physical space between people. So you can fix the office to kind of eliminate shared offices if you have one, or constructing physical barriers uh, and making sure that if you can avoid in-person meetings, be flexible about it and, and do uh, virtual meetings. That would be some of the options that would be available if you're a law firm. Thank you very much, Eugen. We have one final question for our audience. So the, the question is really more, uh, it's more of an episode that occurred. Uh, and the question is this. Recently, I had a medical office employer that posited to a nurse employee voluntarily left before the end of the year that she is not entitled to the accrued sick time under NYC paid safe and sick leave being paid out even though the employer had an accrual paid out policy. The nurse employee was in a vulnerable group who may be severely affected by COVID-19 if she was exposed to it. How should she handle? So this is William Ng and I'll answer this. So um, there are two separate issues on this. Um, under the New York City paid sick and safe and sick leave, um, under the regulations, um, that time does not need to be paid out under the regulations, certainly if the company decides to uh, voluntarily pay that out, uh, that's a separate issue. Um, if the company had a combined policy, um, that's where it gets a little gray. And unless the company had a written forfeiture policy, which indicates that they are not entitled to um, paid sick leave or, I'm um, sorry, paid, paid time off, then the employee may not be entitled to it. If they do not have that forfeiture policy, then the uh, the uh, the employee would be entitled to some of that time. But again, that's sort of an individual circumstance um, that it really depends on the, that company's policy. Um, and, and that's the best way to sort of address that. So without seeing the policy and being able to understand the situation, um, those are just the ground rules that under the regulations, you're not entitled to it. However, the company does provide for it um, then it's something that they can potentially receive. Thank you very much, William Eng. So this concludes our program for the afternoon. Uh, thank you, Eugen and William Eng again for your time, the presentation, and giving back to our communities. As a kind reminder, on the left-hand side of your screen, please find the event references tab that is available for you to download. 
Should you have any questions, please write to us at probono at abony.org. That's P-R-O-B-O-N-O at A-A-B-A-N-Y dot O-R-G. Uh, please feel free to share today's video and content with your networks, contacts, and social media. And for those joining our restructuring and bankruptcy presentation for tomorrow, see you then, same time, same place on this platform. Thank you very much.